I think a lot of this can relate to this. You're having a dream. And I mean, you are in it. This is a good dream. You can feel your heart racing. You're about to have your big moment. It's building. It's building. Maybe you're really mad. Maybe you're mad in this dream and you got a finger going. Maybe you got a you get a hand on your hip and you're really about to have your big moment. And just when you're about to let this other person have it, beep, 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 right? Your alarm wakes you up. And then, you know, maybe your other person is, is there in the, oh, good morning. Oh, don't you good morning me, right? And it's not something that they've done. Right? They didn't do anything, but you still have this false memory. You still have this imprint. Your heart is racing. You have the experience of the memory. How about this one? How about, has anybody done this before? You heard a story told so many times over and over again that suddenly it becomes your story. How about that, right? You're hanging out with your family and you're going, oh yeah, remember that time? And I, I, mom told me to go down to the corner store and I had the money in my hand and I was riding my bike and I was going and then it fell and I off the curb and the money went everywhere. The whole family's just cracking up and your brother goes, ah... Uh, no, that was me. I was the one on the bike with the money. It fell with the floor. What are you talking about? Who's done this before? Our brains are capable of doing this, right? Our brains can create false memories. And, ooh, that's not changing. Let's try it again. Play. No, still not changing. Play now. Shall I do this without slides? Maybe. Hold on. Again. Our brains are totally capable of doing this where we do a... All right, I'll do it without slides then. Without, uh, we'll have a, a false, false memories. And it's based on the narrative that we tell ourselves. It's based on the emotion that is driving that narrative. And so I've learned to be able to talk about when our memories serve us, when our memories do not serve us, uh, when it's reliable, and how we can use that to our advantage, in fact. Um, okay, today I want to talk about uh, some stuff that I've learned in overcoming uh, trauma. I'm not going to get into any of that today, but I do know that uh, our memories can help us as we learn. Our memories can help us forget. Our memories can help us heal from whatever trauma that we aim to overcome. And this, it works out in the workplace, right? So this works out when we have dramatic situations, when it's really, really difficult, when we're suddenly uh, super stressed and uh, the build is broke, right? It's a Friday and somebody decided to push to production. And so what happens is all of this comes out and we will work on our own trauma in front of each other at in the workplace. My name is Christina Aldon. I am a speaker, a trainer, a brand strategy consultant based out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I am really, really grateful to be here. I want to say thanks so much to Vox and to all of our sponsors and all the organizers and the volunteers. I grew up in a tiny, tiny little town in the U.S. and I never thought that I would ever be an international speaker. And, and I love the Greek people. I love Greek food. And I'm always looking for, for ways to come back <laughs> anytime. So, 
Uh, the important thing about memories is that they hold the key to better communication, to emotional intelligence, to uh, being open to the viewpoints of other people, right? And also for setting boundaries for people who don't necessarily respect our boundaries. And this is why it's really important for us to understand what our memories do and what our memories are. Our memories are uh, the faculty by which the mind stores and remembers information. Really, it's, it's something remembered, right? And this is also how we encode, store, and retrieve information. And while we can upgrade our machines, we can't always <laughs> upgrade our brains, right? But there are certain things that we can do to improve our brain performance, to improve our capacity for learning. And this also helps us in our career development, in our per uh, professional, and in our personal lives. Uh, so if we start breaking this down, we can think about how our brains are always taking in information, internal and external information. We get stimulus from internal hunger, right? How we're thinking, the narrative that we're telling, the story that we're telling ourselves, and from external, our heat. Uh, uh, maybe somebody is giving some kind of a trigger to us that is, that is going to trigger us into an emotional response or, or we start telling a story or a narrative. And so that narrative, it drives our emotions. And brains, brains are really weird. Who's done this lately? Oh yeah, the last time you were over for dinner six months ago and you know, we were having the... No, Christina, actually, that was a year and six months ago. Right? Our brains can compress time. And with COVID, the same day has been happening over and over and over and over again. We've had kids at home, uh, people who've not been working remote, and now suddenly they're home, and the same day happens every day. You don't know if it's the weekend, you don't know if it's daytime, you don't know if it's nighttime. Our brains have this capacity to compress information. And so uh, I want to talk about some of the ways today that I have uh, been able to overcome brain fog. Who's struggling with brain fog these days, right? COVID brain, long COVID, even just having the same day over and over again will cause uh, brain fog and it will affect our work performance. It'll affect our relationships. So today I want to talk about our memory systems. You know, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, biological storage, how to improve our memory, uh, emotional intelligence, conflict management. All of these things are really important. Um, Balrick and Ebbinghaus, they, they conducted some research in 1984. It said that we actually start forgetting most of our, our, our stuff, our memories start coming in around four or five years old. So around four or five years old, we start, I guess I don't need that. Around four or five years old, we start forming our memories. And, Actually, we don't just have one memory system. You know how we used to say uh, there's left brain and right brain, right? People say that and they identify and they go, oh, no, I'm just a left brain person. That's all. You're just going to deal with me, whatever. I'm just a right brain person. That's all. You're just going to have. Guess what? You can't use that excuse anymore because you can say, you learned it right here, Vox Days Athens, Christina Aldon. There is no such thing as left brain and right brain thinking. In fact, we store our memories and our learning in six different memory subsystems. And that is when they come in, around four or five years old. So the types of memory systems that we have, oh gosh, you're missing out on these gorgeous slides. All right, uh, type of memory systems that we have, we have a declarative memory system and we have a non-declarative memory system. And so declarative memory, we can train. Non-declarative memory, that is the one that is uh, subconscious, right? And so um, we use different memory subsystems for things. We use uh, a memory subsystem for short-term memory. We use a memory subsystem for long-term formulas. And so if we are... Hey, you want to try and fix this slide? <laughs> if you'd like, sure, if you can... Uh, uh, but our, our first one for a declarative memory... Three separate memory subsystems. So we have a working memory. This one is the one 
where people, if you struggle with ADHD, does anybody here, you maybe you've had some kind of short-term things, right? ADHD people struggle because this is where the new information collides with the old information, and you've got two to 18 seconds for that information to collide. And a lot of people who struggle with ADHD, they, they really struggle with that. So that's the working memory subsystem. Next. Yeah, I know. Uh, it, it worked earlier, too. <laughs> Next, uh, episodic memory. Episodic memory is when we store certain events. And so it's like, uh, remember that day that Christina gave that awesome keynote and her slides didn't work and she spent the whole time, but she totally rocked it anyway? That was an amazing event. That's our episodic memory subsystem. And so you might remember things like uh, your wedding, right? Uh, an episode, something that is an event. The other one is the semantic memory subsystem. And so when we talk about our declarative memory with our semantic memory subsystem, if I got a ball, it's red, and I throw it all the way to the back of the theater, you can see it. You're going to see, look at the semantics, the data. There's no narrative attached to it whatsoever. Did you see the ball? Was it red? Did it go to the back of the room? Yes. It's a different thing entirely if you go, oh my gosh, did you see that? Christina almost hit me in the head with a red ball. Now we're attaching a narrative to it. That's not what the, the semantic memory subsystem does, right? Then we have non-declarative memory system, and this is just automatically there, right? So priming is an example of that. Our priming is something like, uh, it, 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 it's perfume. It reminds you, you know, somebody walks by and, and you go, oh, wow, that reminds me. My grandma used to wear that perfume. Because you, you smelled it so many times and it's very, very familiar. We also have conditioning. We can condition our memory subsystem and that is just like Pavlov's dog. We've heard of Pavlov's dog before, right? Oh, look, here we go. Look who decided to come to work today. <laughs> Left click and right click. Oh, and then it, and then it, I broke it. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Oh gosh, now, now you're showing everybody my secrets and can, yeah, that won't work either. We gotta, hey, extend, here we go. We're gonna extend it and go. All right, anyway, we're talking about we are talking about conditioning. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Look at that. Conditioning, let's go to conditioning. Can we get there? Thank you, oh yeah, good. See, look at all this that you missed. D definitions, man, steamy. Oh, see, the encoding, storing, retrieving. I was pretty proud of that one. I love my font, these. Thank you, thank you. My narrative, I mean, I looked for that emoji forever. That was, that was a good one. Cool, cool. Yeah, four to five years old. Okay, okay, declarative, non-declarative. There, whew. Oh, wow, okay. Conditioning is Pavlov's dog. That's when you train your brain through repetition, right? Pavlov rang the bell, the dog would salivate, feed the dog. We all know how that, then pretty soon, he just had to ring the bell, and then the dog would salivate, right? You didn't have to worry about it. Then we have motor procedural. This is what we do with repetition. It's a dribbling a basketball. It's swinging a golf club. These are the six memory subsystems that we have. Everybody has them. You're not left-brained. You're not right-brained. You're using your declarative or your, or your non-declarative memory subsystem. And again, it depends on that narrative, right? How we encode, how we store, and how we retrieve our memories. But here's the thing. Brains lie. Brains lie. And so our memories can deceive us, as we saw earlier, right? In dreams, uh, if it, we are attached to a story. Uh, for example, if you... Um, 
If you struggle with connecting with people, let's say, and this is real for a lot of people. I'm not talking about, oh my God, this is you know, COVID, I'm struggling. To, I mean, people who, for whatever reason, you know, it's a real thing. And maybe they start thinking, and maybe they're, they start thinking from a victim mindset, right? And then suddenly you can start replaying old things in your life, old events, and through that victim mindset, you're actually creating false memories. Our brains are totally capable of this. And so in extreme cases of trauma, even, you might just dissociate all together and you can separate certain memory subsystems from each other and they're isolated. Uh, oh, here it is again. <laughs> this is so funny. Um, and so, <laughs> and so, um, you know, uh, here's a story. If you are going through, like, uh, let's say you go to the movies with your friend. And you say, hey, friend, let's go watch a new Avengers movie. Awesome. Doctor Strange is great. I love Doctor Strange. You love it. You're eating your popcorn. You're focused on the movie. And you go with Jane. And you have a great time. And then two weeks later, you're walking down the street. And you see, run into Jane. And you go, hey, Jane, what's up? Guess what? You should go see that new Avengers movie. It was really great. This happened. That happened. And she's going to go, you're kidding, right? That was me. I was there. You... Oh, no. It, that was you? No, it was me and John. But here's the thing. It depends on your focus. And if you're focusing on the awesome popcorn and you're focusing on the, mu on the awesome movie, then your brain's just going to fill in the friend spot to, you know, John or who, whoever that works. And I've, I've totally done that before because we have interruptions. You don't know that because, you know, you, you're stuck with this one for a while, but... Interruptions can be retroactive or they can be proactive. And if the interruption is significant enough, this is the number one cause, the number one reason why we forget things. Interruptions, distractions. And so uh, what I do is I use this technique, right? So when my kids, I'm a consultant, I work from home, when my kids run in my office and they go, hey, mom, I want to, can I run it? I go, just a minute. I give them one of these, right? Because uh, you can do this to finish up whatever thought, finish up whatever email. There it is. See, I told you. Uh, finish up the email, finish up the call, finish up the text, whatever that is, finish it up. Listen, the world doesn't explode if you take five seconds to finish that up. Because I'll tell you what, if you don't finish it, it's gone. And we know this as developers, right? Everybody's seen the graphic. Oh, you're, you're juggling all the balls and somebody runs in and they go, hey, can I just interrupt you for five minutes? And all the balls are gone and it takes you an hour. And that's a fact. Data tell us that it takes at least... 55 to 60 minutes to pick up all those balls and put them back into the sequence again. It's never just a five minute interruption, never. And so that is really important because at the end of the day, you have to remember that what we see is not what we get. And yeah, what you see is not what you get with my slides today either. So here we go. I, you know what? Here it is. You, you, uh, you know, no. What you see is not always what you get. In fact, because remember, our brains lie. I'm just going to have a real live active troubleshooter the whole keynote. That's, that's fine. I can work with that. It's all good. So we could totally improve our memory. Um, it's possible. This is what it does. It improves our capacity for learning. It improves our capacity for relating, for taking in new information, and for sharing that information with other people. We could do this by neuroplasticity. Who's heard of neuroplasticity before? Raise your hand really high because I love this. I'm the emotional intelligence woman and I talk all over the world. I've been in all seven continents and I talk about emotional intelligence, and when I used to talk about emotional intelligence, only two or three people raised their hand. So I'm super excited that now people know about neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means you can teach an old dog new tricks. We have this saying in the U.S., and they say, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And my mom always does that, and she's like, oh, yeah, what do I know? And I go, actually, mom, no, uh-uh, nope, not going not gonna to fall for that. 
In fact, you can teach an old dog new tricks thanks to neuroplasticity. Because if you stimulate a neural pathway over and over again, if the stimulus is strong enough or repetitive enough, you actually can create new um, memories, new neuro bundles. Look at those beautiful neural pathways, synapses. You're going to get more protein synthesis at the, the uh, connections, uh, thicker myelinated sheaths, more connections. And so that's what neural. Uh, plasticity tells us. This is my experience. So who knows what, you, you know, those little metal hairpins, right? Those little, we have 110 watt outlets in, in the U.S. And so there I was, little Christina crawling around the floor of my grandma's house, and I picked up a hairpin zzzt, right into the light socket. And I ran to my mom, going, oh, it bit me, it bit me. And she didn't know what the deal was until she kind of figured out, all right, Cool, that, let's not do that anymore. How many times in my life do you think I stimulated that neural pathway? That's it. Once. If the stimulus is strong enough or repetitive enough, guess what? We're going to learn the lesson, okay? And so that's what neuroplasticity tells us. And so what neuroplasticity also tells us is that as it helps us remember, it also helps us forget. So if we don't use it, we lose it. And this is why I can only say, est-ce que tu un cravate in French? That's it. Are you a tie? It's totally useless. I don't even, three years of French that I studied and I didn't ever practice French. And now <laughs> I have no recollection of how to speak French whatsoever. So neuroplasticity tells us that just as we can stimulate the, the, uh, the neural pathway over and over again, if we don't use it, we lose it. And it takes about five to six hours for this, this process to start. Now, if we have something really deep in there and the groove has been really stimulated over and over again, it might take some time. It might take 21 days. We've heard that, right? 21 days to break a habit. Sometimes it might even take longer. Sometimes you might even need therapy or, or you might need some extra repetition. But the things that I'm going to tell you today, if you just pick one technique and practice it for like three months, watch what happens with your brain. Because the cool part about brains is that as you start managing that data and moving across, other data go along the neural pathways with it. It's really, really cool. And so when we start talking about uh, memories, I don't know, I, uh, we can uh, practice <laughs> processing data at a shallow level or at a deep level. If it's uh, meaningfulness, there's meaningfulness attached to it, then we're going to have even more. Oh, that's what you're doing, huh? Cool. It's a magic thing. Shallow or deep processing. And when we add purpose, when we add meaningfulness, it is going to have a, a lot deeper significance for us. Uh, there is a really good uh, tweet. I'm going to let you do it. I, I don't, it's like cursed or something. You know, I went to that, uh, that alleyway, the, the witches one, and they have the witches on. Maybe they cursed me. I don't know what... Um, this is a really good from Dev Nakima. She put up uh, uh, some tips about how to conduct meetings because, listen, there are 7.9 billion different ways to take in information. And the goal is to get your brain to take in information uh, and learn in the best way for you. And so she says, you know, front load the data. Front load me with information Give me time to process it and respond. Uh, make asynchronous collaboration possible. Allow me to communicate in text, right? Real-time meetings are a lot to process at once. I'm short on working memory. I'm probably bored. <laughs> it's taking everything I have to stay uh, I engaged and listen for understanding, right? So when we want to improve, oh, you do it. When we want to improve our memory and when we want to improve our meetings for everyone, we have to think that introverts and extroverts are going to take that information in differently. So let's talk about how we, uh, what are we going to talk about? Encode our memories. 
how we encode our memory. So it's really important that if you do have some kind of a, a brain issue that you consult a professional and not a brand strategy consultant, right? Let me, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I do have firsthand experience about how these tips specifically help me, help my mentees, uh, help my coaching clients, and so it improves uh, their collaboration and their uh, results from their team. The first thing about why, uh, what affects our encoding memories is our focus. Remember, we talked about the movie, right? Whatever you're focused on, that is what we are going to remember. The next thing that we are one that influences the way that we encode information is relaxation. We can take a slow and low, oh, even better if you make the sound, oh. It relaxes our nervous system and it gives us the signal to have neurotransmitters go through our system to relax our nervous system. Then we're going to be able to encode those memories. We're going to be able to create more opportunities for ourselves. We are going to be able to create our own luck, right? I'm the lucky girl. I believe that we all have the ability to create our own luck, and uh, this is how I have done it. So we can improve our encoding through uh, this technique, I'm from Las Vegas. We, we like to play cards in Vegas, right? We like to play cards. And so we do this, this trick where you take a deck of cards and you actually can memorize the order that they're in. 52 cards. And it really surprisingly would probably only take every single one of you, I mean, unless you have a, a neurological, it would probably take you about two to three weeks and you'd be able to memorize 52 cards all in a row. One other thing that you can do is you can put out uh, the memory game. Who's, who's played this before? Where you play the memory game and you flip them and you go, okay, those match, right? Match, and you can say, all right, these are where the red cards were. These ones are just the white cards. These ones are all spades. Whatever it is, you can pay, play the memory game. You can time yourself. That's another way to improve the way that we encode our uh, brains and encode our memories. It improves your brain performance and your ability to take in information. The other thing that we can do is move through action. And so if, if you have more action, then that releases a neurotransmitter. What neurotransmitter does that release? Noradrenaline, noradrenaline hormone. And so as you're moving, that helps us encode more information and it trains your nervous system to take information in. So this is where we get things like experiential learning, right? And this is where they tell you uh, if you're, if you're uh, studying a certain way with a certain environment, then go take the test in the same way under those same conditions because that is how we improve our encoding. Another way that we can improve our encoding is through the shoot the thumb technique. Shoot the thumb. Ah, oh, shoot the thumb technique changed my life. Mm. I learned about shoot the thumb technique on TikTok. Everybody, show me your thumbs. We're going to shoot our thumbs, right? Right like this. What you do is you actually shoot uh, your thumb. Shoot, 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 shoot. What this does is it does bi uh, bilateral stimulation. Bilateral stimulation is also going to improve our memory by holding the memory in your head, shooting your thumb, and moving your eyes as it goes along. I used to be really horrible at this. I used to be like tapping and all, it was, it was bad. But shoot the thumb technique is a really good technique. So shoot your thumb, then shoot the other thumb, then shoot the other thumb, then shoot the other thumb, shoot it, and then you can go back and forth, and it's bilateral stimulation. That's where a lot of that left hemisphere, right hemisphere stuff comes, right? The cool part about it is that as we train our brain and we do that, other data follow. Hey, three months, remember, it's okay. Be, be gentle on yourselves, like, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I've been practicing, it's all good. So uh, remember, uh, as, as that data transfers, 
then we start to encode memories better. It improves our capacity for learning. The next one I want to talk about is a spacing effect. Somebody said this uh, in our chat when we talked about the, um, there was a question uh, about how do you remember and what techniques that you use. And so the spacing effect, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're here now. We're, we're, oh, see, I get this. I'm like getting better now. This is almost like a game. I know, you know, I, I, they're my slides. I know there's a, yeah, it's cool. Wiggle, action. Yeah, I knew we can go to the next one. Thank you. Watch, shoot the thumb. Spacing, oh yeah, yep. I know, yeah, it's wild. No, you're doing great, I appreciate it. Have you done this before? This is good. You should, you should be a spear. It's, yeah. Um, so uh, the spacing effect is, is really, really helpful. You can, uh, can remember a list. Like I do this for my PubConf talks. I do this for my Ignite talks, where it's five minutes. I practice more for those talks than any other talks because you know I could just stand up here and hot air and everything. But uh, but the the five minute talks they're really tough, and so you got to practice, practice, practice. And you you read it, you space out some time, you read it again, you go to sleep, you get the benefit of memory consolidation. And then when you wake up and you read it again, in fact, it's really solidified. It's surprising how well the spacing effect works with, with things. And it really starts to train your brain to start encoding memories better. The last one for encoding memories that I want to talk about is relaxing. It sounds simple, but uh, we cannot take in new information. Vasopressin is a neurotransmitter that helps us take in more new information and, and process it. It goes through our whole entire body. And so uh, when we are relaxed, then we are able to remember things better. So here's a little wrap up of that summary, maybe, maybe not. And then we're going to talk about storing memories. Storing memories. So uh, when we store memories, we use our senses a lot, which is kind of cool. Sight, sound, smell, taste. We have a sense of agency. We have a sense of blushing. We have a sense of heat. We have a sense of hunger. All of these different senses, right? Um, and so we can use uh, this sense of blushing, sense of agency. But here's the thing. If we go to our next one. Our senses, our senses can be tricked, right? If we change the lighting, if we change a shadow, will it play? Such a mystery. Oh, it almost, yeah, kind of. Yeah, see, so we can change the shadow and actually trick our senses. And so we have to use multiple senses. Um, here's, here's something to know, though. If we are overloaded in senses, if we use five senses, let's say, in fact, it doesn't work out so well because with five senses, we're going to, a confused mind says no, what we say in marketing and advertising, a confused mind says no. So we can change, you know, slight things, I don't know, maybe two or three different senses that's going to help us. So that's why when I do things like I take notes, I write them out. Right? You've heard that before where people want to write out their notes because they like the physical, you're feeling it on the paper, maybe you're feeling the, 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 the pen, you're, you have that kind of, instead of just auditory. Some people, though, are more auditory learners. Some people learn math more visually. Let's say you're taking a test and, and you need to hear a lecture instead, and so it's really hard for you. But uh, some people, maybe you have like your... Your special hoodie, right? Remember we talked about when you have to go to uh, a test and you're studying and there's action, there's this association thing that we have about storytelling. And so maybe you got to have your favorite conference hoodie because every time you study math, you have your favorite lucky hoodie. So then when you go into your test, you have to wear your same hoodie. That's called association. I teach a workshop where we build a mind palace like, like Sherlock Holmes. It's pretty cool. And it's all about associating it with a certain element and a certain thing um, in, in a familiar place, right? So if you marry it with information that's already there through storytelling, then uh, it can be very, very helpful. 
The next one I want to talk about is a mystery. Oh, our hippocampus. So our hippocampus is where our memories are stored. That's the part of the brain biologically that the memories are stored. The next thing I want to talk about is that bilateral stimulation. Remember, shoot the thumb is bilateral stimulation because we like things in chunks. In the U.S., we have uh, phone numbers that are, uh, what is it? It's 10 digits, I think. And so, you know, you ask somebody for their phone number and they go, all right, cool. Yeah, here, you go grab your pen, paper. All right, sir, I got my pen. I got my paper. Great. Go ahead. Give me your number. And they go, all right, it's 0170 Wait, wait, wait. No, no, just your phone number. Yeah, that is my phone number. It's 0172212. No. No, no, no. Just give it to me like a human and not a psychopath, right? Everybody knows it's 0170255521212. There's a cadence, there's a tone. We like things in chunks. In fact, the data tell us that we like things in chunks of seven to remember them. And so that is how we uh, process our, our information when we store it. That is really important to, to keep in mind. So when we want to improve the way that we store things, we can do things like yoga. Eight weeks of meditation, even in people who have never meditated before, for 10 minutes improves gray matter. You like grow more brain matter in eight weeks. It's wild. It could totally do it. And it is going to help you improve your storage. The other thing that we're going to look at is your feelings. Oh, you got to manage your feelings. Emotional intelligence tells us that how we think of things, that narrative that, that drives the story, right? Um, I grew up in, in, in right near the shores of Lake Superior, and so my uncles were always telling us about stories and, and how they um, grew fish, uh, caught fish. And so, you know, the first story would come out and the fish would be this big, and then the next story would come out and then the fish would be this big, and the fish would get bigger and bigger every time this, with the story because they had this emotion to it and the, the story gets more dramatic and, and we really attach that narrative and that emotion to it. The other thing that I mentioned earlier is association, right? We got to have our favorite conference hoodie if, if we want to associate information. The next one is to create chaos because a lot of us are on autopilot. We drive the same route home, we eat the same thing, we walk the same way, and so we get to be on autopilot, and what that does is it puts our brain on unaware mode. And so if we can kind of create chaos every now and then and shake things up, it's gonna help us remember things. Next, I want to talk about repetition. Repetition, again, remember the motor and procedural memory, right? That is how we remember things better over and over again. Our, our keyboard strokes, you don't even think about it, right? Sometimes people ask you what your phone number is and you have to pull out your phone and go, um, I don't know, what is my phone number? Let me look at it. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, documentation. Uh, documentation, yes, documentation for improving storage. Here's something that happens in meetings: is that we do things <laughs> and we don't document them, and then two years later we want to migrate it into .NET Core. We want to migrate the chain, whatever it is. The project, maybe the project didn't work then because of budget, because of resources, because of people on the team, because of timing. When you document things, don't put, we didn't do this. Document it and say why we didn't do this. Because then maybe two years later, the funds become available and now we can do it. Maybe we didn't do it just because uh, our manager didn't like that, that tech and now he's not here anymore. So we can actually do this. And so if you document not just the what, but also the why and the why not, you're going to be able to uh, process things a little bit better and be a lot more efficient. The next thing is to facilitate meetings. We have heard this before where somebody comes up and goes, hey, I got a great idea. We should do this. And someone goes, um, yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. It was a great idea two months ago when I brought it up. And then now you're taking credit for my idea. 
Like, what's, what's the deal? What are we talking about? And that's because if you don't have that process and you're not taking those asynchronous notes, like we talked about earlier, right? If you're not taking those notes and you're not managing that, then it becomes a little bit more difficult while you're facilitating these meetings about who came up with ideas, why they came up with ideas, why those ideas were not adopted at the time, and, and why there were. And the last thing I want to talk about is the von Restorff effect. Has anybody heard of the von Restorff effect here? Von Restorff effect. The von Restorff effect. This is where uh, if something is unique, it's going to be remembered. If something is unique, it's going to be remembered. So I used to work at a hotel, and we had a, a policeman and his, his canine partner staying with us. And uh, I was sitting there in the hotel lobby with him and another policeman, and they were talking about how, oh, yeah, I always pull over speeding ticket uh, cars that are red, always. The other one was white. I had just gotten my driver's, no, I had been driving a little bit, but I had a little white car and they were making fun of me. And they're like, I'm going to pull you over because I always give tickets to white cars more than anything. And the other one said, no, 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 no. I always ticket red cars more than anyone because for them, that's what stands out uniquely. And so here's a summary of those things for the improving of our storage. And we can look at the Final one, which is retrieving memories. Retrieving memories. So we can retrieve memories. Um, Tolving uh, did some research in, I don't know, okay. Tol Tolving is the <laughs> scientist who did research about most of the issues that we have with remembering things are actually with memory retrieval. It's memory retrieval that, that is an issue. And so um, we are unable to retrieve the memories. Um, let's say I, I do this a lot now. This is as I get older. It's a fun little thing. I walk into the kitchen and I go, oh, what the heck was it coming in here? All right? And then you got to backtrack and reassociate. Like, why am I standing in my office right now? I'm just... Hey, okay, well, I'm in the fridge. I may as well like grab a snack. I don't know, like what is happening. And so uh, that's 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 memory retrieval. Sometimes you might say um, uh, you're trying to explain something to somebody, right? You're sorry, you're trying to explain. Oh yeah, it's a show. She's in the show with the guy and the, the head and the two arms, and you know he was he was in that show with the girls, and she did the thing. Like, that's memory retrieval issues. And so as we get older, we aren't training our brains as much in the memory retrieval area, and those uh, subsystems are not being stimulated as much. So this is a, a few ways that you can improve your memory retrieval. Number one is to use the same method every single time. So, for example, uh, to open up our, our gate uh, in, our, in our house, you, you could push the button on the left or the button on the right, and sometimes it, it's, it's confusing. But if you like, I made up a, like, a little line, so now I remember, okay, if I'm looking front, I, I push number one. If I'm looking and I'm going out, I push number two to go out. And so you know which button to open the gate and which button to open the other gate. And I do it with the same method every single time. The other thing that we can do is intentional recall. And through this, this is how we teach it to another person. Because then we can see what kind of gaps we're missing, right? As the other person asks questions, we can see what kind of uh, questions they're asking and what gaps we have. And it sinks the information into our brains and our memories better through that memory retrieval with intentional recall. The next thing I want to talk about is staying healthy, and this seems very, very obvious, but this is the number one issue that affects memory retrieval. It's the number one thing. Sleep, eating, being calm, right? That's the number one thing that affects memory retrieval is because we don't take care of our bodies. We don't exercise. We don't have good blood flow through our brain. And the last one is to observe mindlessness, right? And so maybe there are some areas of your life, and we talked earlier about being on autopilot, where you might just want to clean up the foggy edges of, of your mind because you're doing this mindless stuff over and over again. And what happens is your brain, with the same thing over and over again, remember, oh yeah, you were over at my house six months ago for dinner. 
No, 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 no. That was a year and six months ago. Our brain is always trying to work toward efficiency. This is really helpful. It's a helpful quality, you know, for example, for a prisoner of war, right? It's the same repetitive day over and over again, and our brain has this quality to be more efficient. So um, here are all of the, the summaries for that. And what I want to encourage everybody to do is, you know, think about some questions as we go through the rest of the conference. I want you to think about, as you're going through the conference, to, ooh, what's my first question? Think about what do you remember? What do you remember? Are you sticking to certain speakers? Are you sticking to certain topics? Why? Right? That engages multiple memory subsystems when you think, what did I remember? Number two, I want you to ask, compare notes and foci. Go talk to another friend. Say, hey, what did you get out of that? What notes did you take? right? It's the intentional recall. Go home, share it with somebody else, share it with your team. That intentional recall, that uh, going back to how you retrieved it, it's all improving your memory subsystems. The next one is um, what deep processing did you do? What had purpose? What had meaningfulness to it? That is going to sink it into your memory subsystem. What shallow processing did you have? right? Um, what distractions did you have? Remember, interruptions are the number one reason why we forget things. But here is the big secret, especially in tech, that people carry this big shame <laughs> over them. The, uh, the whole thing is, is that you don't have to remember all the things. We all Google things. Right? I've been uh, in marketing and, and branding for uh, 15, 16 years. I still have to look up every now and then the simplest things for, for Photoshop. If my brain's just not thinking about that or in that way, I'll still have to look something up for, for InDesign. And, you know, if we are just creating these tests that only test when we're hiring people one single memory subsystem, it's not really going to be effective. Are we testing uh, the ability to just recall things? Or are we actually testing the ability for people to use the technology in a creative way to solve creative problems for our clients? That's really where the value lies, right? Because we all Google the things. And so um, the same goes for children, right? So I, I believe that instead of like just teaching them to, to memorize and just to be another cog in the wheel, let's, let's encourage them to think more creatively through, through problems. Sure, we can look things up, go get a dictionary, go use Google, that's fine. But how are you actually applying that information? And um, as, let's see, do I have, do I have one more? Oh yeah, those are, those are the tests. Like we're just testing semantic memory subsystems at, at that point. I want to test the whole entire human. I want to test all of their emotions. And so, um, you know, as I stand here before you today, I want to encourage everybody to uh, just think about not how well we remember these, these little facts here and there, but how we are using those to solve problems for our, our clients in a creative way with, with empathy, with kindness, and with emotional intelligence. So, uh, and one more question is I wanted to ask is, does anybody remember if I was wearing a sweater at the beginning of, of this talk at all, or, or glasses, or a name tag, or a scarf? <laughs> Anything? Oh, I don't know how to do it. Let's see. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, if anybody wants to talk to me, you can talk to me about, you know, how to improve your brain if you're working. I, I do lots of executive coaching and, and mentorship, and especially people who are neurodiverse. I'm neurodiverse myself. And so if you have a very specific topic that you want to work on, then I'm, I'm happy to help. So thank you very much.